all of you must have come across a thermometer at some point in your life. If you haven't, congrats on your super strong immunity. Be it digital or a classical one where you have to squint your eyes trying to figure out what the temperature it's reading, a thermometer is extremely useful in the diagnosis process. But a thermometer also has some negative effects. It gives you away when you're telling your parents you have a temperature when in reality you just want to miss school. Maybe after making this thermometer and now studying about it, you can use your knowledge to tinker with it and make it work in your favor. Now that you have made the device and have it on hand, let's try and understand the principles and concepts behind its working. We can also look into its real-world applications and types. Apart from the capillary tube and dropper bottle, you can find all the other materials required at home itself. These two will be available in the market at an affordable rate, but might be a little hard to find. We will provide you with these materials so that you can experiment with different variations and understand the concepts behind this device completely. If you've read anything about a thermometer before, you must have come across a fact that they're made of mercury. But we made this thermometer without the help of mercury. So why was it used at all? How are thermometers manufactured? What is the difference between the one we made and the ones we see in the market? Do you actually need mercury to make a thermometer? And what are the different types that exist today? From 1612, when the Italian inventor Santorio Santorio, yes, his first name is the same as his last, became the first inventor to put a numerical scale on his thermoscope, which is an earlier version of the thermometer, until 1714. There were many different versions of the thermometer, but none very accurate. Finally, in 1714, Daniel Gabriel Fahrenheit, the German physicist, invented the first modern mercury thermometer. And in 1724, he introduced the standard temperature scale that bears his name, Fahrenheit scale, that was used to record changes in temperature in an accurate fashion. He based the scale on the human body temperature. Originally, the human body temperature was set at 100 degrees Fahrenheit on the Fahrenheit scale, but it has since been adjusted to 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Then what is the cent centigrade or Celsius scale? We all know what a centipede is. It's a creepy crawly with 100 feet. So a centigrade scale means one that is divided into 100 degrees. In 1742, the Celsius scale was invented by Swedish astronomer Anders Celsius, and it had 100 degrees between the freezing point and the boiling point. The liquid inside the glass tube is either made of mercury or alcohol, and the markings on the tube are according to the Fahrenheit or Celsius scale. All the thermometers that we have spoken about, including the one we made, contain liquids, mercury, alcohol, water, and so on. And so they are called liquid thermometers. Liquid thermometers are based on the principle of thermal expansion. When a substance gets hotter, it expands to a greater volume. Nearly all substances exhibit this behavior of thermal expansion. It is the basis of the design and operation of thermometers. As the temperature of the liquid in a thermometer increases, its volume increases. The liquid is enclosed in a tall, narrow glass or plastic column with a constant cross-sectional area. The increase in volume pushes the liquid upwards in the glass, thus the height of the liquid column increases. The change in height is proportional to the increase in temperature. Suppose that a 10 degree increase in temperature causes a 1 cm rise in the column's height, then a 20 degree increase in temperature will cause a 2 cm increase in the column's height. The relationship between the temperature and the column's height is linear over the small temperature range for which the thermometer is used. This linear relationship makes the calibration of a thermometer a relatively easy task. Calibration is the placement of divisions or marks on the tool to measure a quantity accurately. How do you calibrate it? Well, we know that pure water freezes at 0 degrees and boils at 100 degrees, by definition, in the Celsius scale, at an atmospheric pressure of 1 atmosphere. If we place the thermometer in ice water, pure frozen water, and wait for the liquid in the thermometer to reach the height representing the freezing point, we can mark it as 0 degrees Celsius. And if we do the same with the boiling point, we'll get the 100 degrees Celsius mark. 
Since we saw that the relationship between the temperature and the rise in the liquid is linear, the space between the two markings can be equally divided into 100 points to mark 1 degree Celsius each. In our DIY thermometer, we made use of the same working principles as the other liquid thermometer. When it is dipped in hot water, the liquid expands and then rises up the capillary tube. And when it is placed in cold water, the liquid contracts, thus going back down the tube. The main difference between our thermometer and the ones in the market is that our thermometer is not calibrated. So we will know if a liquid is hotter or colder than room temperature, but we will not know by how much. And knowing the temperature is important for diagnosis of fever and in industries to test the exact temperature of a liquid and of course for all those interested in the weather and meteorologists. To answer one of our earlier questions of why mercury was used and if we can make thermometers without it, mercury was most widely used in thermometers as it has a very high coefficient of expansion. This means that the slightest change in temperature would result in a significant expansion of the liquid. On top of this, mercury has a very high boiling point, so it can be used to measure lots of liquids. But this doesn't mean that the laws of thermal expansion don't work with other liquids. In fact, we saw it work ourselves in our experiment with water. Looking at the formula, you can tell that the linear coefficient and the change in length are directly proportional. So since mercury has a higher coefficient, we will observe a higher change, hence improving the accuracy of our measurements. Now that you understand how exactly a liquid thermometer works, you can make some variations of the device. Since you've already worked with water, take it a step further this time and try calibrating it. Use the method we talked about. If the space between the two points is too little, you can make 10 degrees Celsius divisions or even bigger. Whatever works for you. You could also try using a blend of alcohol and water to see what happens. Does alcohol rise more than water? If yes, what does this mean about its coefficient? Read some more about the different types of thermometers and try experimenting with one if you have it at home. If you come up with any cool variations or find exciting results with these ones, do let us know. Once you build your calibrated water thermometer, experiment with it. Try to see if it actually works. Use a store-bought or already calibrated thermometer and use it simultaneously with yours to see if they have similar results. Try using dirty water instead of pure water in the DIY thermometer. Now compare it with the results from the initial one. Are the boiling point of water and the freezing temperature different? Why or why not? If you make the water even more unclean, will it make any further difference? Some scientific terms. The Celsius scale is also called the centigrade scale and is based on the boiling point and freezing point of water. The Fahrenheit scale is based on the human body temperature. It was made taking our temperature to be 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Thermal expansion is the tendency of matter to change shape, volume and area in response to a change in temperature. Mercury is an element. It is a liquid at room temperature. It's a metal and has a very high coefficient of thermal expansion. Calibration is the process of making markings on a tool according to linear properties to use it for measurement. Thermometers are very useful devices in the everyday world. We already know a couple of the most basic uses to measure body temperature and of course all weather stations need it. They are used in roadways in cold weather to help determine if icing conditions exist for safety reasons. They are used in air conditioners, freezers, heaters and fridges for climate control conditions. They play a huge role in nuclear power facilities to measure the temperature of reactors so that it doesn't result in a nuclear meltdown. So without thermometers, we might not have been able to prevent the rotting of food. We wouldn't have any ACs and we could possibly destroy a whole town. We hope you enjoyed making this instrument and have had fun experimenting with it and now also have a better understanding of how it works, what the parts of a thermometer are and how the liquid rises. Most importantly, understanding its use and significance in everyday life is important, which we often take for granted. Now go and check your newspaper and start recording the daily maximum and minimum temperature in your city on a daily basis. Goodbye.